Do we start? I think we need to start. Everyone, please come in. Sit down. So, uh, a very good afternoon and welcome to The Bigger Picture, the plenary dedicated to EASA 21 Plus, the mysterious internal EASA campaign. We often compare our efforts in conservation and this campaign to a journey. If that's the case, we're delighted to introduce ourselves as your guides for the next 90 minutes. I'm pleased to introduce my fellow guide, Simon. I'm Tomasz. We can't promise you that this guided tour will be as picturesque as a walk to the beach would have been, but we'll still try to fill it with something interesting. We are streaming this session live on the EASA Facebook, which is also my opportunity to say hi to my niece and nephew, as well as to all the other viewers. The recording will be placed on the EASA YouTube, in the EASA 21 Plus uh, Facebook group, and then in the uh, member area of the uh, EASA website. Well, this is a guided tour, but I think what was already an excellent introduction to this session was the opening session of the, uh, of, of the conference, don't you think, Simon? True, true. I think um, Edith Perron this morning told us to, to talk more to each other and maybe find a language we can share and, um, and that can fit for all of us with all the different cultures so we can develop and uh, maybe to use a term from the animal training, reinforce our own cultures to, um, to develop this um, wonderful idea of, of EASA and our ability to contribute to the bigger picture. And along those lines, what we hope you will get from this session is a better understanding of how the big policy plans and global strategies matter for your institution and for the entire EASA community. But also to give you an idea how you can contribute and how you can benefit through the three main areas that we identified for EASA 21 plus, and that is environmental education, species and genetic diversity conservation, and preventing wildlife trafficking. So this will be the content also of this plenary session. Yeah, and it is a journey, and maybe it's, we are all on the same path, but some of us are starting in different locations or at different situations. Some of us are still packing the bags and others are scouting ahead. Um, but I think we can all learn from each other and share our experiences. And we are here on behalf of the campaign team. So for more than a year, uh, there has been a group of colleagues, both from the membership and from the EASA office, who tried to give this uh, new baby the, the shape that would be most relevant and interesting for, for you as EASA members. So we are representing the whole team. Uh, there have been around 20 uh, colleagues in the membership uh, who have been involved. We want to thank them all for their involvement. Uh, and uh, they will be happy, we will be very happy to continue the dialogue also after this session. But we would like to invite Eric, Eric Riva, the chair of the campaign and chair of the conservation committee, uh, to say a few words uh, in, in the first place. Eric, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be here and see you all face to face, although the light is a little bit, uh, a bit difficult to look at in front of me. Well, uh, as you know, this morning we had an incredible, uh, incredible uh, presentation about uh, these intercultural um, connections that we have. And I can tell you that I can say Kokoriko in eight languages, but I will not do it today. So what I'm being asked is why, what is the big picture and why we are doing this campaign now? And most of you have already heard about it, participate in it. But this morning, we also saw that there is a quarter of the attendance of this uh, uh, conference. That This is their first conference, so they might not, not know all the, the big picture and the reason for the campaign. So, the state of nature is not improving. There are several assessments that estimate one million animals and plant species that are threatened with extinction. As the Azada, as a community, we have a responsibility 
to help and to make the best impact we can. That's why last year we adopted a new vision for EASA, progressive zoos, saving species together with you. Sorry, I forgot the aquarium. Something happens to me all the time. So progressive zoos and aquarium saving species together with you. It is a confirmation of our ambition to the most effective and efficient we can be. Because for modern zoos and aquariums, and for our association, this is the way we want to develop in the first century. And of course, I forgot as usual to put the slide on, sorry. So if we are serious about being progressive, about wanting to save species, and about working together with you, with our public, with our partners, with our governments, then it's clear that we can't do it in a vacuum. In other words, our vision places us in the global puzzle of biodiversity conservation that you can see here. The puzzle was already very complicated before, and now new important species are being added to it. First, the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, we will soon, and then soon we will have also a global framework, new, a new global biodiversity framework. It will be a last minute attempt to stop the loss of the natural world, and I will come back to this later. These plants can be a real game changer if they do what they promise to, and that is unite everybody under the common goal and start a true transformative change in people's approach to nature. Even if the framework won't be as ambitious as expected, it still is the best action plan for nature that we can have. Whole citizens, all sectors of the economy and society will have to contribute and this, of course, includes modern zoos and aquariums. To be able to contribute, we need to know where all this is going. The easy way would be to ask our Brussels people, the policy team in the EASA office, to write an explainer for EASA members. But just reading a summary and knowing what's going on is not enough. As a community, and and as each of us individually, we also need to be competent and confident to engage with that's what's going on. To build this competence and confidence, we need time to reflect on the new plans and discuss what they mean to us. That is why the EASA office, and I want to quote our EASA office, especially Thomas and Danny that were at the beginning, the, the backbone of this campaign, proposed an internally focused campaign called the EASA 21 Plus to explore these new plans for nature together and to define what role we should play in this challenge and in the new global framework. So that in the long term, we can maximize our conservation impact. We don't have to invent new ways of doing what we already do. We need to be the most effective we can do in what we can do. And we need to get better at reporting what we do. EASA must be able to demonstrate the conservation impact of our entire community. Yes, again, we are talking about the conservation database that my family this morning talked to, you, talk, talk to us about. We launched the campaign one year ago during the virtual annual conference. We heard a call for action from Jean-Paul Rodriguez, chair of the IUCN Special Survival Commission. In autumn, we ran a member survey, and we, the campaign team wants to thank each of the 411 colleagues who responded to that survey. It helped us to pick the topics, and it will be relevant not only for the new biodiversity framework, but also for our daily work. And then in February, we began hosting EASA 21 Plus workshops, both virtually and in person. We have had so far seven of these uh, workshops, and we will have three during this conference. So please attend these workshops because they are important. The workshops will continue until summer 2023. Afterwards, we will capture all the conclusions in a toolkit for all EASA members. But like I said, just reading, just reading a written toolkit is not enough. I invite each of you to take the EASA 21 plus topics and bring them home to your zoos and aquaria and to your national associations. 
discuss them, brainstorm with our colleagues and your colleagues, and find the best ways in which you can make a difference. The first initiatives are already happening. For example, the Swedish Zoo Association hosted an EASA 21 Plus workshop in March. German-speaking zoo educators met in June to discuss how they can make also most of this project. Hearing stories like this makes the campaign team very happy, so please keep them coming. Register your institution, but also sign up individually to be part of this journey. We need more of you to be engaged. There is also a Facebook group where you'll find all videos, recordings, and share your ideas. It has now 430 members. Let's make it double during this conference. And I, it's really a challenge that I give you to do. Simply follow the QR code that you see here on the screen. Along the last years, we have not only started discussing internally, because it's important for us to evaluate what we have been doing, we have so analyzed the work, review our processes, developed new strategies, but now it's really time for action. We are at a crucial crossroad. We don't have time to wait more. We need to work together for a better future for us, for our children, for our planet. This campaign first aims to do an introspection of our work and our process and our role in conservation individually and collectively, at all levels, but especially in education conservation, in, conserva in, species, in field conservation and wildlife trade. We have now developed new tools and standards. We have new standards for conservation education, for research, for field conservation, and soon we'll have a new acquisition and disposition policy that is being prepared and discussed with many of you as we did yesterday at the tax chair meeting by the EP committee. So in my opinion, we are now ready to, be, to do a better work and to contribute to the new biodiversity framework and for a better future. It is time to walk the talk and not only talk. It is time for action. It is time to, be, to build a better future. Thank you very much. And I would like now to introduce our next speaker, which is Hugo Shali. And this person is uh, um, among, uh, two, uh, among um, almost 200 governments, also the Euro European Union as a whole, are in the final weeks of negotiating the new post-2020 global biodiversity framework. We have asked the lead negotiator from the EU, Hugo Maria Schali, to tell us how it is going. Mr. Schali is an Austrian diplomat. He has been in the European Commission for the last, past 25 years, and some of you may remember him from his work with the CITES, or against global deforestation. Now he's promoting the European perspective in the new global plan for nature. Unfortunately, he could not be with us together, so, we cannot give him the floor, but we can invite him in the big screen. Thank you very much for your attention. And don't forget, join the campaign. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually for this opening session. Uh, I apologize that I can be, not be with you in person, but we are in a very intense period in the preparation for what I'm going to talk to you today. Notably, the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties of the Convention for Biological Diversity that will be held in Mont December in Montreal. Uh, what is the background to all this? It's the global biodiversity crisis. It is uh, that we face uh, threats to biodiversity and species caused by indirect drivers such as demographic and sociocultural change, economic and technological developments, uh, effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of institutions and governance, and the impact of conflicts and epidemics. There is also a, a number of direct drivers that affect 
terrestrial, freshwater, and marine environment biodiversity, such as land and sea use change, direct exploitation, climate change, pollution, invasive alien species, all this leading to a steadily increasing rate of human induced extinctions of all species. And that's really one thing that is uh, something that is threatening the quest of the human community to reach sustainable development. Biodiversity is key to that. Biodiversity loss is a threat for humanity, not least because almost half of global GDP is linked to nature. That also means that the current discussion that we have at the international level about the the main environmental crisis, notably biodiversity of climate change and pollution, needs to be seen as closely linked. And closely linked means that positive action on one will have positive impact on the others. Uh, the example is, of course, that climate change exacerbates the effects and the rate of biodiversity loss, but biodiversity. So intact biodiversity and ecosystems are an important element in both mitigation and adaptation to climate change. That means we need to look at decisive actions, not only to stop biodiversity loss, but also to uh, restore and recover biodiversity and ecosystems that we may have already degraded or, or destroyed. So the time for action is now. And I think we, as I've said uh, in a, a minute ago, this has something linked to health because we've seen that biodiversity loss has actually in, uh, increased the risk of infectious and zoonotic diseases, uh, COVID-19 uh, that comes from close contact between humans and uh, wildlife is one example. It actually uh, means also that the conservation and sustainable use will actually be a positive factor in uh, uh, recovering after the current crisis and it will help us increase uh, our global and uh, local prosperity. It will also be a moment when the European Union in the world will have to exercise leadership and will also have to demonstrate that we take our responsibilities seriously. Uh, seriously, uh, of course, also expressed by all the actions that we have taken under the European Green Deal, uh, where we have important elements that directly uh, uh, speak to biodiversity, but also indirectly. Uh, now, what are we talking about in the, on the global scale? The CBD is one of the three Rio conventions that were negotiated and adopted in the context of the 1992 conference on the on the environment and development so there is a link already in the institutional setup between the united nations uh, framework convention on climate change and the united nations convention to combat diver, um, desertification C cbd has three main objectives they're all of equally importance and are all equally um, reflected in the current framework. Uh, we want to conserve biodiversity and ecosystems on the one hand. We want to make sure that its components are sustainably used and uh, have a specific third objectives that uh, the uh, benefits from the utilization of genetic resources should be shared in a fair and equitable way. That is what we are currently uh, debating and negotiating in the CBD context. We should not forget that there are a number of other international agreements that uh, are important in the context of biodiversity. The, and I think some of them are of particular relevance to you as a community, starting off obviously with the CITES Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species. But there are also the conventions such as Ramsar on wetlands, others on migratory birds and uh, and, and they are. So uh, interesting to note that the 19th COP of the CITES Convention will be held just before the, the CBD COP in Montreal. Uh, we have a very complex setup that I briefly show on this slide with the convention bodies. And uh, I think it's worth to note that for the purpose of negotiating some of the main outcomes, we have the open-ended working group for the bi global biodiversity framework. What are we preparing for exactly? And it's uh, a 
it's actually four meetings in one. It's the meeting of the conference of the parties of the CPD. It's the conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Nagoya Protocol and Access and Benefit Sharing, the tense COP MOP, as we say, for the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And linked to the Cartagena Protocol, we have a protocol on liability and redress. All of them seek to adopt the range of decisions that will shape the implementation of those instruments that we hope have a positive impact on uh, what we can do for uh, stopping biodiversity loss and recovering and restoring that biodiversity in the coming, coming decades. So most importantly, what we're hoping to adopt is a range of decisions on the implementation of the CBD, focusing on a new global biodiversity framework, which would replace the uh, IC targets that were adopted in uh, 2010 in Nagoya. But we are also uh, looking at adding to this global biodiversity framework things that we did not have in Nagoya, and that's notably a, a strong mechanism for monitoring and review of the implementation of the GPF and how to actually step up our ambition as we move along in, in implementation and link to them a strategy for the mobilization of resources that are necessary for that. Uh, in addition, we are looking for elements of a solution for an issue that has plagued CBD discussion for a decade, uh, namely the uh, discussion on ABS and notably on the increasing use of uh, digitalized sequence information on genetic resources that uh, really has plagued our discussion and has created a lot of mistrust between scientific and uh, business communities around the globe. So it's actually good to look at uh, where we are in the process to date. Let us not forget that uh, COP15 was actually supposed to happen in 2020 and that for obvious reasons we've taken a two-year delay in developing the outcomes. When you look at that slide, you'll see that there are sort of the succession of meetings that have brought us to the state today. Uh, very intense process in the first half of this year and uh, accompanied by a number of informal processes on resource mobilization, monitoring and review of implementation and ABS DSI. Uh, looking at the next uh, slide, uh, I wanted to show you the structure of the uh, global biodiversity framework that I will uh, go into a little bit more detail in the, uh, in the next couple of minutes around an, uh, a 2050 mission. Uh, we have uh, the uh, definition of the uh, results that we hope to achieve by 2050, which expressed in the goals, it's the first circle, and some intermediary goals for 2030, which is the second circle. The third circle is actually the, out, the, out, the, the targets that are the actions that we hope to see undertaken by 2030 uh, to ensure that we move forward in the direction of achieving the mission and the goals by 2050. Now, uh, all that is in the global biodiversity framework uh, framed by a text that uh, sort of summarizes the vision, the mission, establishes the context of the principles that applies to the framework. I'll give you an example. Of course, one of the most important principles that we always highlight is the uh, issue of the precautionary principle. It actually goes on to discuss uh, implementation support mechanisms, uh, defining the in enabling conditions, not least, for instance, the uh, question of governance and very importantly, the question of how to generate political will in all countries to implement. It actually also goes on to two sections on uh, responsibility and transparency, which is not least linked to the issue of monitoring and review, and also the definition of national targets and ambitions and global targets, also ending up with a section on uh, the uh, uh, sort of communication and, and awareness raising. That gives a framing to the overall framework, but it doesn't actually uh, sort of go into what the framework is seeking to achieve and what are the roles of uh, national goals and targets in that regard. Now, uh, clearly the 2050 vision, which is unchanged from 2010, is looking at 
uh, living in harmony with nature. And I think in that context, uh, I would like to hark back to a very important report uh, the, that UNEP published in last year, which is Make Peace with Nature. And I think that what frames our approach to this. Now, the 2030 mission, which is basically our order of business, what we all need to undertake uh, and to uh, sort of see a first result in 2030, uh, is that biodiversity must be better off in 2030 compared to 2020. There's still a lot of discussion how we would frame that and phrase that in the context of the GBF. So, as I've said before, the goals means we actually need to establish where we want to be in 2050, whereas the targets are uh, sort of what is it that we need to do by 2050 to make sure that we get there in time for 2050. Uh, we are uh, have a very high level of ambition as the EU. We want those measurable and, if possible, quantifiable goals for biodiversity outcomes for 2050 and increase the area of national natural ecosystems. The valuation and the sustainable use of biodiversity uh, and, of course, there is one specific thing that we are aiming for in the goals and the target that we actually significantly decrease the ecological footprint of human activities and bring everything within planetary boundaries. Uh, as with regard to the um, uh, financial resources, there is obviously a quest to close the what we call the financing gap for biodiversity by mobilizing resources domestically and internationally, but also to ensure access to and safeguard effective sharing of benefits are derived from the utilization of genetic resources. Uh, the targets, I mean, there is, there are, as you've seen, 22 targets, so I don't have time to go into all of them, but I mean, there are a number of key targets that for us, there, are, there is a very focus on ensure a commitment to protect 30% of lands and seas, to restore uh, 3 billion hectares of land and freshwater ecosystems and 3 billion hectares of seas and oceans ecosystems, uh, to reduce uh, the, the use of pesticides in agriculture and to reduce the emission of excess nutrients. There's also a link to other process of ending plastic pollution. We want to have clear uh, targets for the sustainable use of wild species, so illegal logging, wildlife trafficking, overfishing. Uh, to promote and ensure sustainable use of biodiversity in key sectors such as agriculture, forestry and agriculture. But beyond that, mainstream biodiversity objectives in all sectors and, very importantly, aligned financial flows. There is a focus from that we also have on ensure that when we implement the uh, GBF, we also base the approach to implementation on the definition of nature-based solution that we agreed on at the last year's session of the United Nations Environment Assembly. Now, we also want to do something on invasive alien species, on climate, on knowledge generation, public awareness, biosafety, but I can't go into all of that. Two very important enabling parts and uh, dealing with other uh, objectives of the framework is we actually need to ensure that necessary financing comes from all sources, uh, means not only international public financing, but also domestic sources. An important element is the reduction and redirection of harmful subsidies. And of course, we want to see that countries establish national biodiversity financing plans. Uh, we hope to achieve a, a consensus on elements of a solution for the issue of digital sequence information something that is a highly technical, but also highly politically controversial subjects. Now, coming to uh, the key element from the implementation point of view, which is the strengthened monitoring and review of implementation, something that has been missing from the uh, IEC framework dearly, and which from our point of view has been one of the key factors of the lack of implementation. Uh, we need a strong monitoring framework as a basis for the reporting by parties with a limited set of headline indicators that actually are connect connected to targets and goals so that we can actually check whether what parties are doing or have committed to do 
will help to achieve the overall goals and the mission, the vision and the mission. And that is the basis for a cyclical process that of review of implementation. And when you look at it, it's obviously inspired by what has been achieved in the context of the Paris Agreement. There would be uh, national reports, but the national reports would be including or be complemented by the establishment of national targets. These national targets will actually help to, uh, uh, in the process of the implementation, to uh, do a global gap report, which shows us uh, to what extent the actions that are undertaken by parties to CBD uh, will be able to bring us to the desired result in 2050. So uh, where are we in the process? Uh, we uh, are in the process in the EU to adopt our final statement of ambition that would be take the form of council conclusions adopt, to be adopted at the 24th October Environment Council. At the same time, we are preparing the uh, uh, conference in Montreal, which consists mainly of two parts. From the 3rd to the 5th of December, the working group for the establishment of the Global Biodiversity Framework will meet in Montreal and prepare the conference of the parties that stands that starts on the 17th and will run in principle till the 19th, but may run into the 20th December of, of, of this year. We have a big job to do, very hectic couple of weeks before us, but I think that uh, it is uh, our big ambition to come out with a framework that will decisively change the action uh, at the global but also European level in view of the uh, achievement of and of the vision uh, that we would actually ensure a net gain for biodiversity, a, a nature positive outcome in the years to come. Thank you very much for your attention. I know, right? But people, it's about nothing less than the survival of life on our planet. Um, and it's a topic we need and must engage with. Um, and you have to consider Hugo's video here as the, the safety instructions for this part of our cruise. And uh, next up, we'll be talking about different other topics. And the, the issue of um, diversity and the issue of biodiversity for me is a question of richness. Um, and it's, it's that thing that makes our, our life on Earth and our species more resilient and strong to be able to deal with change. Um, next, we'll hear from three experts in the three topics that we have uh, judged are the most relevant for us in our community to really delve into. And first up is the wonderful Christina Wilson, um, who used to be just working with apes, and I didn't know her, but uh, recently she's delving and she's going to bring us right into the big dive of biodiversity in the genes. Thank you, Simon. So um, today I have, um, I will be wearing several hats today, I must start off with saying, um, but all of them are linked to biodiversity conservation in different ways. So first and foremost, I'm a researcher, I'm a geneticist based at Copenhagen Zoo, but I'm also a member of the IUCN Conservation Genetics Specialist Group and the Conservation Planning Specialist Group. And I'm also a member of an EU cost action network called G-Bike, focused very much on biodiversity. And last but not least, I'm also chairing the Alpha Biobank, which is a community resource very much focused on providing uh, samples that will allow more research into biodiversity and how we can better um, understand it and, and protect it. Um, so, let me see. So, whoop, the next... Um, 10, 15 minutes, um, I hope to put a spotlight on something that is invisible. Um, and I hope that I will be able to convince you about its importance and also inspire you to get it get involved. But first, I would like to start out with a very, very simple quiz. 
Um, so I would like to start with asking you how many levels of diversity there is in biodiversity. And it's a simple, you know, raise your hand. So for those of you who believe there is one level of diversity within biodiversity, can you please raise your hand? Oh, this is looking good. And the next one is, is there two levels of diversity in biodiversity? No. And what about three? Are there three levels of diversity in biodiversity? Yes. Excellent. And so now I know which slides I can keep and which ones I can skip. And, and hopefully this little exercise also woke you up a bit. So let's dive into it. Um, so species all over the world face extinction. And the current loss um, of species is estimated to be between 1,000 and 10,000 fold higher than the natural extinction rate. So this rapid decline in species and population declines, habits has been fragmented, altered, uh, damaged at an unprecedented rate, is leading to severe loss in biodiversity and the benefits it brings to both people and nature. Um, as means to kind of counteract um, and reverse the laws of biodiversity, nations need to uh, report and align with international conventions and obligations. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, Esther, there it is. Good. Um, such as the EU biodiversity strategy, which we heard about just previously, and also the Convention of Biological Diversity. So, um, the most important international agreement on biodiversity is the CBD, the Convention of Biological Diversity. It is designed to protect species diversity, ecosystem diversity, and genetic diversity, uh, and the treaty has been ratified by no less than 196 nations. Um, among other achievements, CBD has pushed countries to create national biodiversity strategies and to expand their networks on protected areas. So the need to monitor biodiversity was globally recognized in 1993 when the CBD became effective. So there are three levels of biodiversity. Whoops, there is the ecosystem diversity, the species diversity, and the genetic diversity. And the variation within our DNA is called genetic diversity, and that can be found among uh, individuals and among populations of the same species, which is also something that we um, term as intraspecific genetic diversity. So increasing human pressure is leading to rapid environmental changes, which often result in observable changes in terms of population sizes that declines, species distributions, and also decline in genetic diversity prior to extirpation. But in some cases, population declines are less apparent. So genetic diversity is the third and often overlooked level of biodiversity. It is a prerequisite for uh, evolution and for long-term survival of both populations and also species. It facilitates adaptations to uh, both environmental and climate change and new pests, diseases, and it can augment species uh, diversity by supporting ecosystem resilience. It provides resilience after devastating events and allows for species um, restorations uh, as well. But actions need to consider all three levels of biodiversity if they are to be successful. So it is also very, very important that biodiversity at all three levels is mapped, monitored, um, and sustainably used if we are to safeguard uh, biodiversity and the benefits they, uh, it brings. Um, I will just briefly also mention that uh, currently, um, there are several ways that you can uh, look at genetic diversity, but there are also some techniques that do not allow for that. And some of you might have heard of eDNA and barcoding. Currently, those um, techniques are not fit for estimating uh, genetic diversity. Um, eDNA barcoding is sometimes used for presence absence of species. This is my good colleague uh, leaning here, taking a sample from a water pond. Uh, looking for, for this guy, the Bombina Bombina. So eDNA can be used to, as a presence absence, and also um, uh, for looking for the presence absence of carnivores, for tracking individuals, etc. But applying genetic tools does not per se mean that you estimate genetic diversity, let alone monitoring, monitoring it, which I will come back to. So genetic diversity among populations can reflect adaptations to local environment and also ecological conditions. Um, 
Genetic diversity offers tools for evolution, adaptation, and resilience of populations and species. So if we look at these examples, so high genetic diversity means high gen adaptive capacity, good potential for long-term survival, and also high resilience. Um, an example would be the Atlantic killerfish in North America that rapidly adapted to polluted sites in North American Atlantic coast due to high genetic diversity. Low genetic diversity, on the other hand, means low adaptive capacity, weak potential for long-term survival, and low resilience. An example would be the wolves on Isle Royale in North America as well. Few founders, severe population declines, bottlenecks, highly inbred, uh, inbred small populations. So now we all know what genetic diversity is. So now we will look uh, a bit um, on a historical timeline. So um, as we heard before, um, the CBD, um, it became effective in 1993. Um, and then in 2010, we have the IEG targets, which I will come back to. If we fast forward here to more present years, um, then there has been some recent developments and also new initiatives emerging, looking into genetic diversity uh, and influence in policy. And then most recently, uh, we have the EU biodiversity strategy for 2010. Um, there. So, um, in uh, 2010, the IG targets were published. And implementing um, conservation policy for genetic diversity has lagged behind. The strategic plan here uh, for 2011-2020 um, was a 10-year framework for action by all countries and stakeholders to save biodiversity and enhance its benefits for people. In that uh, was the AEG target 13, which mentioned genetic diversity, but only for domestic species um, and their wild relatives. So it was very weak in terms of genetic diversity and no mentioning about wild species. But fortunately, there are negotiations now for the new global biodiversity framework of CBD. And I want to highlight that a lot of these different initiatives um, and looking into conservation genetics and, and genetic diversity have also formed the Coalition for Conservation Genetics. Uh, in order to help push and, and use our influence, both researchers, practitioners, people from, from the YASA community, using our networks, our channels, to help push uh, for new clear goals, targets, and indicators for uh, wild species and preserving the genetic diversity of them um, being implemented in the global biodiversity framework of CBD. So, now we go and look at EASA and what we've done for genetic diversity and what we are doing. So actually, EASA has decades of experience uh, and attention towards genetic diversity. We have, for instance, our breeding programs where we've actively used genetic diversity as, as a benchmark, something to strive for within our populations based on pedigree uh, data. Um, I won't go too much into this. Uh, for those of you who would like, can come to the EPMAC meeting where we'll go more into detail with this. But for those of you who have in situ projects uh, for populations of species and want to look at genetic diversity, not just a snapshot, but, but look at genetic diversity over time, so meaning monitoring it on a temporal scale. You can go and have a look at the new ICM guidelines published two months ago, also produced um, by some within the YASA community as well. Um, there are some very good um, criteria, suggestions, guidance in there, as, long, as well as a framework for how to go about monitoring genetic diversity in populations and species as well. Within EASA and also outside EASA, we are also focusing very much on genetic diversity when we're talking about populations and species. This is an example from the Global Species Management Plan for Banting, Barbarossa, and Noah and the Sumatran Tiger. And this is just the example of the Banting, um, where genetic diversity is mapped for the wild population in Indonesia, but also for the um, groups for the Indonesian zoo population, for the European zoo population, and also for the North American zoo population as well. In order to contrast the genetic diversity across the in situ ex situ uh, continuum and to increase diversity where possible. Another example would be the cotton top tamarind, native to Colombia, very uh, low in numbers, 
partly and mainly due to the massive export of individuals for biomedical trade in the 1950s, leaving this wild population uh, very low in numbers. Uh, after the ban on the biomedical trade, um, individuals were relocated to Europe and North America. So our hypothesis is that there is much more genetic diversity represented in Europe and North America than there is in Colombia. Genetic diversity is also um, looked at in terms of the Alps of population and also actually because there's been so good sampling in Colombia, genetic diversity is used actively to help combat the illegal trade in this individual, uh, this species, sorry, because it allows us to um, assign geographical origin to illegally uh, trafficked individuals. Um, we're also adding another component, which I think is key to, to mention here as well, and that's the historical perspective in this. So with museum samples dating back from the 1800, um, 1850 to 1900, um, we are able to assess the genetic diversity in the population in the wild before the anthropogenic uh, impact um, of the biomedical trade. So it, al it allows another benchmark, so to say, in terms of genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is also very much used in reintroduction um, efforts as well. For instance, um, in order to compose herds for reintroductions for the scimitar horned oryx, um, for the Scottish wildcat and also for the Iberian lynx as well, where it's a mix of pedigree-based data and molecular-based data as well. Um, so genetic diversity is also something that we can use in terms of illegal trade. So this is an example with the chimpanzees, um, where a, there is a collaboration with the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance to actively test all uh, the more than 1,000 chimpanzees in their care. Um, they are confiscated from the illegal trade, and with just a few hair sample, uh, a few hair straws, we can assign the geographical origin of uh, these illegally traded chimpanzees, pinpointing the exact origin uh, from where they came from um, in the wild. Um, but genetic diversity, genes, etc., can also allow us um, allow a fingerprint uh, for individuals. So, for instance, samples being held in the biobank, we can do fingerprinting on those samples. And again, a tool that, together with the metadata in the SIMS, is a powerful tool for help, helping to combat the illegal trade, which could, for instance, be in the black-winged starling, um, the colored laughing trash, uh, the radiated tortoises, or even tiger species, just to give examples. So I will end up with how you can get involved. Sample, <laughs> do sampling, because um, we need samples both now and in the future if we are to look at genetic diversity. Put them in storage and keep them safe for, for the future. Either use the Yasa Biobank or if your institution has the facility, uh, the resources, the infrastructure, then bank the samples yourself. But make sure that you register them in SIMS, which is the registration database uh, for the Yasa uh, Biobank. Um, but also look at existing collections, for instance, museums, uh, research institutes, biobanks, etc. There are samples out there from your EP population, historical samples representing individuals that are long gone. Um, so look at those as well in, in order to um, have an extra um, uh, component in terms of looking at genetic diversity of your populations. Um, if helpful, assess whether molecular genetic diversity uh, of your EP would be helpful and also in order to contrast to the wild population. Um, for instance, if you do have the monitoring project of an in situ population or species, you can go and have a look at the guidelines to see if they could be of use to you. Um, it would also allow you monitoring genetic diversity to actually evaluate the effect and the impact your actions have on, on your conservation project. You can also consider whether genetics could be a helpful tool in order to help combat the illegal trade um, in your species of interest. And we will hear more about illegal trade uh, with Kirsten's presentations in a bit. Disseminate, educate both your visitors, the wider public. It is so important um, that we do this. And there are great examples from within our community. And Marjo will be telling more about this also in a bit. Lastly, get involved. Get involved with IUCN. There are several zoos association represented in here that are members of IUCN. Um, the oldest one uh, is the Royal Zoological Society of Antwerp, and the newest one is uh, Berlin Zoo. 
Um, it is so important because you can help influence IUCN and you can have um, uh, be part of national or national or regional committees. Uh, again, something where you can use that as an offset to help influence um, the both local and national uh, policy on biodiversity and strategies as well. Um, get involved with uh, conservation, uh, sorry, to, to specialist uh, committees uh, under the IUCN as well, or other relevant initiatives to raise awareness of the great work of zoos and aquariums in terms of genetic diversity and help lobby. We need more to help lobby so that we can get genetic diversity of wild species, getting that into the global biodiversity framework of CBD. So thank you for listening. Thank you to colleagues, to collaborators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, and thanks a lot for keeping the time discipline. We recently held a webinar on genetic diversity just two weeks ago. The recording will be up on the EASA 21 Plus Facebook next week, so we invite you to check it out there. Um, and we like in IASA 21 Plus to keep our topics connected and find the connections. And uh, Christi uh, Christina alluded to illegal wildlife trade a few times. It is a topic that doesn't need a long introduction because you all educate the public about it. You all cooperate with CITES authorities on confiscations and you all uh, join or run your own campaigns on the topic. But the expectations from modern zoos and aquariums are evolving. And we are expected to make sure that our animal transfers only support trade that is legal, sustainable and ethical. But how do we understand that term in the first place? And drawing from um, Edith's uh, keynote presentation this morning, are we all on the same page across all our countries and cultures? So that's why I would like to invite Kirsten Pullen as the Vice Chair of EASA and the Chair of the EEP Committee, which oversees the rules on animal transfers in the IASA to tell us more on this topic. Kirsten, the floor is yours. Well, that's been a fantastic introduction, not just by Thomas, but also Christina's work and uh, uh, both Eric and Simon setting the scene for what I want to talk about today. Because actually what we want to do is help you maximize your potential for helping the CBD targets to be achieved. And in order to do that, we really need to understand exactly where we fit into this process. So, as we said um, right at the beginning, the EASA 21 Plus campaign is an internal campaign. What we want to do is look at our processes within each of our members and see how we can maximise their outputs and what they're going to achieve. Now, in order to do that, what we actually have to do is define campaign success. We went out and did a pre-survey, a pre-campaign pre survey, as Eric alluded to, and I'll go into that in a little bit more in the next couple of slides. But that helped us define what we really wanted to achieve in terms of campaign success. And it's very clearly up here, particularly from the idea of illegal wildlife trade, what we want to do is make sure that we see a growth in a member's confidence and competencies and proactive support and participation for the goal of ensuring that wildlife is only traded legally, sustainably, and ethically. And that means various things, because it means we're looking at giving messages out to our public about what they are supposed to do with uh, wildlife trade, sourcing reptiles, all those sorts of things. So we're talking beyond our boundaries. But it also means that internally, we have to be very, very confident that we are not part of the problem. We are part of the solution. In our pre-campaign survey, what we wanted to do was find out how people felt about what they were already talking about in terms of conservation education. <clears throat> so when we went out and looked at the results that were coming in, what we found was that um, the respondents, and we looked across a broad range of staff members or VIASA members, so it wasn't just the keepers, it wasn't just conservationists, also the educators, and everyone else had the opportunity to respond to that survey. And what we found was that there was concerns around levels of competence and levels of confidence for our staff, and this was how they assessed themselves, in how they talk about some of these subjects. And just to be really clear, 
What we mean by competence is whether they have the right knowledge, the depth of knowledge that they really need to be able to answer any questions that are posed to them, and whether they have the confidence and the, uh, the competence within the members of knowing that our processes are strong and robust and that we're not contributing to the problem. And so this was a really key thing for us because it gave us a really key way of looking our, at our activities, which are about moving animals around, making sure that we've got the genetic diversity, making sure that we're doing it in a sustainable and ethical way as well. So one of the questions that we asked within the pre-campaign survey was what would you and your organization need the most help with to maximize your impact against illegal, unsustainable, and unethical wildlife trade? And those are very key things that have come out in the talk so far about how we try and achieve the biodiversity, um, the CBD post-2020 framework. And the thing that very clearly came out at the top was understanding what legal, sustainable, and ethical trade means in practice for the individual's organizations. And this is a really key thing that we've decided to start with in terms of making sure that we raise that internal level of confidence and competence so we can talk about things with authority to our guests and our visitors and to our other external audiences as well. So, as Thomas said, one of my roles is to lead on the EEP committee, and obviously this is a really important aspect of what we want to do. And at the moment, we're reviewing EASA's acquisition and disposition policy. So that's going to be a really clear guidance with um, a really clear document with guidance around legal, sustainable, and ethical trade in wildlife. And how we can best help you at this point in time is to make sure we have some very clear definitions about what we mean about that. And that, in turn, will allow us to make sure that the EASA acquisition and disposition rules and procedures are fit for purpose, and then we can ensure that they are properly implemented by the EASA membership. So, we're proposing some definitions that will help us, help you, become more confident and competent in talking to your audiences about what we mean. So the one that we have put forward for a legal trade means that all local, national, regional, and international laws are adhered to when acquiring or disposing of animals, including their ancestors and offsprings. For sustainable trade, it means that the acquisition of disposition of animals, including their ancestors and offspring, does not lead to long-term decline of biological diversity in the wild, thereby maintaining the potential to meet the needs and aspiration of present and future generations. And it's important to remember or to realize that this definition is included within the CBD as well. So we're providing alignment. And then for ethical change, uh, trade, there's a range of bullet points that we believe are important so that we can ensure that we're behaving in an ethical way. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but there's some really key things there. For, for example, subject to a professional process of due diligence that considers a whole of supply chain approach. And that's really key because it means that you're actually making sure that you do the groundwork and the homework where you're looking at your acquisition and disposition. And also, if you're questioned about it, you can be confident that you have done ethically the right thing. Now, it's very important to realize that, or to remember that we're using the word provisional definition at this point, because there are different definitions around this, and we've got to have something that works across the cultures, as, as we alluded to earlier, we've got to make sure we're all talking on the same page, and everyone clearly understands that. And to, in order to facilitate that, what we will be doing at this uh, conference is running a workshop. So this gives you your opportunity to come in and workshop out these definitions with us. And I'd like to encourage everyone in the room, please, please attend, because this is going to set the scene for the review of the acquisition and dispositions policy, and this is your chance to partic uh, participate in that decision-making process. So just to complete this, so what I'm really doing is setting the scene and giving a bit of a big up for the workshop that's going to happen. And that's going to be tomorrow morning, I believe, uh, 8.30. So please, it's an early start, but do come along to it. 
And what we want to do then is be able to collate the input that we have had from the tags. So we've already talked a little bit about this with them but also collate the conference participants' input as well, because you're the members of the IASA, you're gonna to have to abide by our acquisition and disposition policy when it comes out, so come and participate in the conversation to get it sorted. During the rest of this autumn and winter, we'll be looking to finalize the definition and draft updated IASA acquisition and disposition rules and procedures. We'll also be looking to uh, have one of the other IASA 21 Plus workshops so that we can share the results of this process. So you know what's happening and you know how those, all your input has been targeted into this very important document. In spring 2023, uh, this document will go forward through the EEP committee and XCOM approval. September 23, it will come to EASA Council for approval and then we aim to have it out for AGM approval in April 24. And this means that this document is going to uh, then make sure that our practices tie in with uh, things Mavan we referred to this morning, where we're looking at completing the first cycle of, of um, accreditation. So we're going to have new policies, new procedures in place for when we engage in the next cycle of accreditation as well. I can't emphasize enough what we need is for you to join the conversation. Come and along to the workshop. Make sure that you follow the EASA 21 campaign workshops within the, order, uh, within the autumn and winter. And then make sure that you're talking to your council representatives for approval of the definition and new acquisition and disposition policy by council in September 23. And what I'm going to do, just if I can go back, sorry, right to the beginning of the presentation, there's just one key thing that I want to... I'll flick back through, but there we go. I want to leave this up here, what we're thinking about here, because again, I think for us, it's been a very different campaign because it's internal. But what this means is what we're trying to do is help you maximize what you can achieve as EASA members to complete what we need to do for the CBD post-2020 framework. Thank you. So every good day trip needs a educational message, maybe hidden or maybe in the open. So first of all, a big shout out to all the educators in the room. So when we want to engage with the CBD or other frameworks, which are important for this whole process, it's sometimes difficult to get a seat in the room. It's not always easy for us as SUS to be taken serious. But when we tell people in the room where we want to go, we educate 144 million visitors every year in our SUS. These doors open by themselves. So our educators are not just good for telling stories, but they're also opening political doors for us to do this work and engage in these frameworks. Um, and, well, I think, um, I think the, the educators have, if you like, a superpower when they, it's about teaching our visitors. And we need this superpower to be focused on one specific target group, and that's us in this campaign. We need to educate inwards and translate some of the difficult things so it becomes understandable for all members, all cultures, and all staff within our institutions. Um, and I think um, it's time now to see uh, Marjo Priha from, um, from Helsinki Zoo. She will uh, take us further on on this journey, and I can give you a small spoiler. It probably will take us even into the future. So Marjo, come and take the floor, uh, and uh, that's it. So, hello everyone, I'm from Helsinki Zoo and I've been working there as an environmental educator for 15 years and I'm also a member of Conservation Education Committee and Conservation Committee. And uh, I'm here to talk about how 
education can contribute to save nature. Uh, we heard Hugo Salis talk about this mysterious framework. I didn't quite uh, hear the word education. He was rather talking about awareness raising, but it's meaning pretty much the same. But anyway, it's really evident that education is in a big part, even in implementation of such a huge uh, framework and its targets. And education is mentioned there, at least in three special targets, but it's connected to, to many more. And uh, in this framework, it's also emphasized the, that it's a question of transformative change, meaning that we really need to do something in a different way. We need to educate also in a, in a more diverse way and integrated it into formal and non-formal and informal educational programs. Uh, we all know that education is at the heart of zoos. It's been there and it's developing. And during this campaign, it should develop even more because we have a great potential, as Simon mentioned, to engage millions millions of people uh, to save nature together. Uh, you can also say that we can contribute to global uh, biodiversity conservation goals, but we have to keep in mind that um, the concept of uh, biodiversity is a bit ill-defined for our visitors, meaning that it takes a while to explain what it really means, like uh, we would need a whole presentation so uh, we're talking about saving nature, at least I do it often, because nature is diverse by its nature. Uh, we have great education going on in our zoos. It's, it's vers versatile and it takes place on site, so in the zoo surroundings, outside the zoos and online. And, um, we all remember what happened when the COVID started. Like the school teachers changed to work online, so did uh, zoo educators and communicators. And it was fantastic how flexible we are. So we need to be flexible to meet the even bigger goals as well. Uh, during recent years, uh, we've been talking about conservation education, uh, which is uh, a bit of a wider context of, of education, having uh, these targets uh, like building knowledge, fostering positive connections, promoting enjoyment and inspiration, and developing skills. And then there comes this motivation for environmental behaviors. So all these targets are defined in the frameworks that we have for our education. Uh, and they are very fresh. Uh, Vasa conservation strategy uh, just came out a few years ago. And uh, also EASA standards are being uh, updated this year. It's on the process. Uh, and uh, in, in this process, uh, the standards were uh, updated in such a way that they align with VASA conservation strategy, so there would not be two parallel uh, ways to define quality education. And I recommend everyone, because I think uh, all zoo workers are educators. I'm sure that many of you have uh, done uh, training, uh, kind of uh, uh, presentations, educations in the zoo or in your previous work. So it's not just the question of, of educators. So I'm recommending all of you to watch the Vasa conservation uh, strategy videos, which explain what it is all about. 
Uh, then these um, a bit tricky concepts, uh, transformative change, behavior change, empowerment. I'm not going to go very deep into these issues, but they're not rocket science. It's just a question of doing things in a different way, getting rid of bad habits. Uh, but then again, now let's go to the real life, out of these concepts and frameworks. So to the normal procedures that educators carry out in the zoo surroundings. Uh, if we think about uh, school groups, because I think they are in the focus uh, of education in most zoos. And uh, we always think that uh, the younger generation can do it better than we. But the thing is now that uh, uh, the change is urgent. We don't really have time to think that people that are adults in the next 20 years can uh, fix what we've done wrong. So we also need to educate us, educate adults, or at least uh, support them in, the, in this procedure for more environmental lifestyles. Uh, so in, in my opinion, uh, when we're dealing with uh, children and young people, I think the focus should be in developing autonomous thinking and understanding more than just pushing more information. Uh, so uh, that's, that's how they probably will be change makers in their adulthood. And then um, us adults. This has been a bit tricky issue for me during the last years as I've been thinking that uh, if we have this opportunity, we have this demand to do something, to be part of the change making, that uh, how to engage our adult visitors to this. Because it is a reality that uh, most zoo visitors come to zoo to have a good day. So recreation is a very high motive and there's nothing wrong. It's great. And uh, uh, we, we need to really take care of it that Zoos are also recreative, recreative places. Uh, then again, we are much better in, in uh, adding on information than uh, creating tools for, for cultural and behavior change. And then again, the fact is that can zoos, well, we can't do it alone, but how much effort can we put on this process? Because the barriers which prevent uh, people from changing their behaviors lie much in, in their cultural and social manners. So it's a question of social change when we talk about transformative change. So we can probably concentrate on kind of more uh, everyday issues and concrete issues that are linked to people's lives. And, uh, also, according to research, you have to keep in mind that uh, environmentally active adults that might be wild about uh, behavior change, they already are connected na to nature and uh, have gained attitudes and values during their childhood towards protecting nature. And uh, one more important fact also is that they are mainly women uh, and they have a fair good socioeconomic status so that they are uh, capable of, of uh, going for, for uh, lifestyles which are not just connected to, to survival. Okay, we're not starting from an empty table when it's a question of uh, making uh, steps toward uh, creating behavior change and uh, kind of uh, making people uh, to work on, on, on saving biodiversity. So there are many zoos already that carry out actions like said here, but then there are zoos that are just taking their first steps 
and then zoos that need resources and skills. And I see this campaign very important that we can share our best practice or experiences. Who knows if it's a good practice? We also need evaluation. And evaluation of behavior change, it's a tricky thing. So I wouldn't put too much uh, pain on thinking that do we manage to uh, create behavior change. I think we need to think about to organize kind of uh, interesting, juicy, uh, fresh learning uh, uh, kind of moments and uh, to, to really engage people in discussions or concrete doing. And we can foster that them to enhance uh, and uh, uh, kind of uh, create biodiversity themselves. And mainly focus on solutions so much, not so much onto problems. So uh, there you have some uh, examples what it means when it comes to zoos working on uh, making people to kind of foster biodiversity. Uh, and then to this campaign, uh, as it's mentioned, it's for us. And I've heard many um, educators asking for toolkits and uh, what are we going to do in the, in the zoo? How do we deliver the messages to, to our visitors? So that's not yet the question. It's coming up, but now it's just for us a bit of time to discuss and think where are we? What is possible to do? What is quality conservation education? Could we do it in a better way? And here are a few topics to discuss in the, in the workshops coming. So like how to follow our standards and, and our strategy to really wrap it up. And uh, also uh, we all need to, to be able to prepare our own uh, conservation education plans. And there is an uh, academy coming uh, this year to, to, to help us on that journey. And uh, I've been talking quite a lot about now this empowerment and uh, uh, behavior change. So it's time, time for us to, to discuss about it already here. So you're really welcome to our open session, Conservation Education Committee open session. Uh, we are discussing mainly about how tags and educators could cooperate because it's also important to, to improve our joint education, conservation and education. Uh, but anyway, you're all welcome to this uh, workshop. Uh, and the big issue is, is that uh, we all are willing to build uh, a culture of conservation education in our zoos in the years to come and rather next week. So, thank you. Kitos, Mario. And for the remaining minutes of this session, I would like to ask my fellow guide, Simon, to make a guided stop. Because we mentioned, or our speakers mentioned a few times, the challenge of opening political doors. So EASA 21 Plus is our time to really figure out how we can maximize our impact in conservation, but also how to maximize the, our political force to lobby on behalf of nature. And Simon had some thoughts on this to share. So Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so this is a five minute uh, for a 10 minute presentation. So don't worry. Um, it's not as much thoughts, it's more like uh, past experiences. So the ASA 21 plus meets Silent Forest. And um, we thought, well, we had a good campaign. Let's go into politics. And I, when I think about politics and zoos, I always think about this picture. We do have um, some great engagement and these two people have been instrumental for the process I'll talk about. But a quick reminder, we had 2017 to 2019, the Silent Forest campaign. We're talking about the Asian songbird crisis. Currently, we are talking about 
or le more than 40 species that are specifically due to this threat threatened with extinction. It was an overlooked, unrecognized topic. We used to have our songbird meetings in the basement. Meanwhile, we're allowed to stay upstairs with the other groups. But we had good education, and above all, we had excellent, for us, the way of our expectations, fundraising. And for that, we can support projects, and we, as with any good campaign, it continues after campaigning and continues the work. So the projects which was initiated during the campaign uh, are still being supported, and Zeus, you guys are still supporting Silent Forest uh, to do diverse conservation projects in Southeast Asia, and in the future, we're expanding, we're branching out to songbird conservation around the world. Um, but back to the politics, our first introduction to politics and songbirds was probably with the protected species list development in Indonesia. We had a meeting um, during some of the Asian um, uh, songbird crisis meetings. We had an uh, interesting meeting. We were invited into the Ministry of Environment. We had a um, nice discussion with the minister and her cabinet. And um, yeah, we didn't think too much was going to come out of this. But a few months or more than six months later, Indonesia published their new species, uh, protected species list, and it had lots of songbirds on it. And we were all very excited. It was very fitting. It was just the start of the campaign. But actually, it met a lot of pushback from Indonesian lobby groups, in particular, the, the groups representing people selling birds or keeping birds. Um, and it became, it was election year in Indonesia. And suddenly we got a letter from the Minister of Environment in Indonesia. You guys, Iasa, you had this idea with the songbirds on a list? Solve it. And um, we, we thought, now well, what do we do? Well, my friend went and saved us. We wrote a letter. She signed it. And we supported this, the scientific backgrounds for why keeping so many songbirds on the list and so forth. But it became political. And a few birds, a few bird species, one of them, the white rump charmer, which we know is in dire need of conservation, flew off the list just because of the lobby pressure. Um, so for me, this was the first introduction. I used to think, oh, we'll provide some good science. Everybody will see it my way, and it's going to work. But reality is, politics and different opinions rule the world. Um, the next one was um, the, the IOCN uh, World Conference in, um, in France. And there we produced, and it was uh, because we had a EASA position statement on songbird trafficking, which we had developed with the campaign. And again, my fan came to us and said, let's do a motion. I had no clue what that was, but um, I no, uh, quickly found out. And uh, suddenly uh, we had a motion, we submitted it, and we had lots of supporters, and it was just terrific. Then... Thomas and Danny asked me, oh, there's this meeting, and we've been invited for years to participate. Could you um, sit in on this meeting? It's online. It's not too bad. So I was sitting in on behalf of EASA, representing our community, not quite knowing what I had to say, um, on a official um, uh, meeting of the MICT, which is the, the intergovernmental task force on the illegal killing of and taking and trade of migratory birds in the Mediterranean. I don't know why the abbreviation is mixed, but it certainly is a, a important topic. It has been going on for, for quite a while. Um, and the issue is, uh, of course, the trapping, the shooting um, uh, of, in many cases, songbirds, so very relevant to our silent forest campaign. Um, but it also affects other species um, and it was a challenge to, to an opportunity to sit in on this. Um, and I will um, try to talk more about this in our conservation uh, committee meeting in the coming days. I forget when it is, sorry. And then suddenly I was invited, because I was in the MIG meeting, to sit in on an Interpol meeting. It was very interesting, the, the background checks you have to do to sit in on an online meeting with these guys. But um, again, learning about Operation Thunder and, and many other activities. Um, but it is difficult then, as one person, to represent the ASA without a real briefing on what is our position. We need to develop positions to 
be able to be in such rooms and talk on behalf of our community. Next up is the CITES Cup. Um, and again, politics is getting into it. Um, there are two songbird proposals um, for the coming uh, CITES Cup. Still, we know that you know, nearly all birds of prey, nearly all parrots, all owls, all of these three groups, they're nearly 100% of species are CITES listed. Um, but international trade in those three groups together is less than, than 500 species. But in the songbirds, we know from our research that more than 1,000 species are traded internationally. So there's a small gap there because only 1.37% of songbirds are CITES listed. And we know that several species could benefit from a CITES listing. One part is the protection. And the other part is collecting data. Because cited listed species generates a, a bulk of data which helps us determine if the trade is sustainable or not. At the moment, we're quite ho uh, hopeful with the straw-headed bilbil that it will be approved. But there are some debate about the white rump chamas because the species has a huge distribution. We will have, at the COP, we will have a side event. We will promote those two uh, proposals, but we will also promote the notion of songbird um, conservation in general, because we think we need to develop the momentum for this to happen in the future. For that, we've also, together with Species360 um, and the organization Monitor, we've developed the Songbird SKI, the Songbird Ski, which is a um, very in-depth, altogether some um, nearly 200 pages on songbird trade, analyzing the international trade. Um, and we have submitted this um, to the CITES um, um, uh, secretariat. And we, we hope that this is all part of the process. Of course, for such a COP, thousands of documents will be submitted. Probably not all will be read by all people. And on site, we suspect it's going to be very political and it has to be very responsive. So fortunately, a small contingency of EASA um, staff and, and EASA member staff will be present at the COP. So how does this, all of this relate to EASA 21 plus? Well, the thing and the more, most important thing, as we just heard, we need to engage with the frameworks. CBD is the main one that we're focused on. But all of these others, uh, CMS, the Convention of Migratory Species, the Berne Convention on Keeping Biodiversity, CITES, we just talked about, Interpol, and the IOCN, they are all players and partners, and sometimes dis discussion partners that we need to work with and engage with. So we're engaging with Silent Forest. We're making advocacy for conservation of something that's not always very sexy, though I think they are very cute. So um, that's it for me. And um, we're coming to the end of the session. Um, I had no idea that Mifanwi and I will feature as exhibits in your guided stop, Simon, but it's an honor. Like it has been an honor to have you with us and uh, be able to share a bit of the topics from uh, EASA 21 Plus. There is more to come. So the ways to join the journey is to sign up individually as an institution, join the community on Facebook. Just during this session, we get uh, at least 30 new uh, applications to join the group. So Eric's persuasion is working its charm as always and attend the workshops. Speaking of which, there will be some that were already mentioned during this conference. Um, we are happy whenever any of you joins the Facebook group and we're happy to see the number rise, but it's really not about the numbers, it's about doing this together. We are exploring it together, we are making it together, and as it seems, we are also baking it together. Uh, it's Ustin and Labem colleagues who raised the bar very high no pressure there, but if you'd like to follow this pattern, send us your pictures or send us your tweets or just invite us to your meetings. We'll be happy to taste them. We'll take tips and cookies. Um, Thank you. This is all for this plenary. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks to those who followed online. Enjoy the break. Bye. <laughs>